please subscribe to this channel if you're not already and click the bell icon to stay up to date with every video we post on this channel. Please also like and share this video as it helps us perform well in the YouTube algorithm. Thank you and enjoy the video. praise the Lord what a wonderful day that God has truly given unto us that once again we may be together again to share God's word there is nothing that should bring the light to any one of us like the word of God because the word of God is life it is a bread of life we as we eat the natural bread to sustain our flesh we eat the natural bread, the spiritual bread, which is the word of God, to sustain and to grow our spirit being. When the apostles were anointed of God and the church was growing exponentially, there was this desire and a need to minister to the people. But you see, the apostles, they understood the secret. And this is what they say to the people. <clears throat> In chapter 6 of Acts, this is what they said. From verse 2, Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we, are, we may appoint over this business. But we, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer, and to the ministry of the word hallelujah we they they chose what jesus even had said maybe we can read john chapter 8 the gospel of john chapter 8 jesus speaking to the disciples or to the people who believed on him this is what he said from verse 30 okay from 31 john 8 from that one then said jesus to the jews which believed on him if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You see, we, we need to learn that for us to belong to Christ, for us to continue being disciples of Christ, we must continually continue in his word. In John chapter 15, I think we quoted last week, John 15, he said from verse 6, If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask whatever you will, and it shall be done unto you. You see, so we must abide. We, we must allow his word to abide in us. We must abide in him. We must belong to him. We must continue in him. And the way we do it is by, by continuing in the word of God. That is why we must delight to read the scriptures. The word of God is life. That is what we have. We have been given the scriptures. Anything that contradicts the scripture is not of God. It doesn't matter who says it. It doesn't matter who have given a prophecy about it. It doesn't matter where it comes from. It is not from God. Because God has magnified his word. Even above his name. He has given us his word. He has magnified. Maybe I can read for you Psalms 132. Uh, sorry, Psalms 138. And I'll read verse 1 and 2 with the emphasis of the last part of verse 2. The Bible says, I will praise thee with my whole heart. Before the gods, I will sing praise unto thee. I will worship towards thy holy temple and praise thy name for the loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above thy name. The word of God comes first. We must all be students of God's word. Paul encourages the young Timothy when he says to him, study the word to show yourself 
approved of God. A workmanship that need not to be ashamed. And that is why we have been doing this Bible study. And we'll continue with these Bible studies. From a verse after verse. Understanding the whole scripture. Understanding the spirit behind the scripture. Understanding the content of the word of God. Speaking what the word of God is saying. Not what men are saying. Because our mind must be shaped by the word of God. Our thought life must be influenced by the word of God. Our prayer life must be guided inspired by the word of god we should be knowing how to worship god and we can only know to do so by the word of god because the bible says when jesus was speaking concerning the worship of the father he said a time is coming and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the father in truth and in spirit you cannot distinguish the two you must be able to worship god in truth where do you find the truth in the word of God. And how do you worship in the spirit? The spirit of God must indwell you. Because it is when you understand the meaning of the word of God. That you will understand. For you to be able to receive the spirit of God. You need to believe in the person of Jesus Christ. You will begin to grasp that. We have finished last week Romans chapter 7. And we saw how difficult it have been. You know and how difficult it is. To, to be able to maintain the balance. You know, and to be able to kill the old man, but then we were able to be to see the triumphant of it that we are able to put to death the old man, the nature that we are, by of course the help from God. He is the only one who can deliver us from being carnal. Because we are carnal by nature, but now when we come to Jesus Christ, our spirit are regenerated, and suddenly we are also spiritual beings. Now there is a contradiction. The Bible tells, we read in Galatians, that the spirit is contrary to the flesh, and the flesh is contrary to the spirit. And so we saw here Paul arguing how we find these two natures within us, contradicting one another, where in our mind we want to worship God, but then we find another law working in us that contradicts our desire. We find ourselves doing things that we don't want to do and not doing things that we want to do. We found that in Romans, of course, and it is a continuation. Remember from chapter 1 all the way to 7, Paul have established that man cannot be justified by the deeds of the law. He have brought forth that we are sinful by nature and we just deserve to be condemned. There is no one who can be justified before God. He have now demonstrated the justice the, that the law is just and holy, but we are carnal and we cannot obey the law. But also we have established the weakness of the law, that in that though the law of God was good and it was wonderful, but it did not have the power to transform our foreign nature. We saw, like James says, the law of God, the law of liberty is that like watch, looking at yourself on the mirror, but though you may see the fault of everything in you, the mirror itself have no power all the the, the 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 guidance on how to change you and so we saw the law of god points sin and it makes sin to be exceedingly sinful but it could not change us and now we enter into chapter eight in chapter eight is one of the most powerful chapter in the bible it is one of the best you know there are people who have personal scripture you can find a personal verse or as personal uh, chapter in the Bible in the name of Romans chapter 8. It is one of the greatest read you'll ever find in the Bible. It, it expounds what God has done. It expounds how we have been saved. It expounds what we should be and who we are. It expounds what God has done and what cannot happen and what will not happen. It opens the fact that God is our deliverer. The Bible says now in verse 8, chapter 1. But before we read, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that God, you may open our mind and our thought train to understand the scripture. Even as we go through the word of God, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, I pray that you may give us the mind and the spirit to grasp the truth of God's word. I pray in the name of Jesus as we go through Romans chapter 8. That God, you may quicken our inner being, that we may understand what the word of God says, what the spirit is saying to us, oh my father, that we may be able to be guided and directed by you, O Jehovah God. For we look unto you, 
and not to another person. We look unto you and not to ourselves. We look unto what the word of God says and we desire to be the fulfiller of what God has commanded us to fulfill. Because by our own self, we can do nothing as the Bible tells us clearly that in us, in our cannot be nothing good dwells. But we thank you, O God, that as the Bible says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, we are able to be delivered from our weaknesses and guided in the path that God has ordained for us. Thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said, Amen. Verse chapter 8 from verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So the scripture says here now, there is no condemnation. You know that we 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 find, you know, that the, the we find that in this all there is condemnation. And truly, when we read from chapter 1 all the way 7, we can only find that the law will condemn us. But then now we find a revelation here that there is now, not tomorrow, now, now, there is therefore, now, there is no condemnation to the person who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. We found, as Paul argues in chapter 7, that now he says that, uh, he says there is this too low, you know, that brings us to captivity. So now he says that he himself, or we now say that we are going to serve or to follow after the spirit. We are not following our after carnal nature. So the two nature may be contrary, but in our mind we choose to follow the person of the spirit. And to such a person who now is in Christ Jesus, who follow after the spirit, there is no condemnation. Why? God did not send his son. Maybe we can read John chapter 3. Let's hold there and go to John chapter 3 and see what Jesus says to Nicodemus. You know, Jesus speaking about being born again or being in this newness of this nature. He says to him, the Nicodemus came to him at night and the Bible says, you, you know, he, he came to, to him at night and then maybe I can read from verse 1. There was a man of Pharisee named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Labi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do the miracles that thou doest except God be with him. And what Jesus says to him, verse 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This was a teacher of the Jews. He was one person who expected to see the kingdom of God. But Jesus says to him that no man, and I say again like Jesus said, no man can see the kingdom of God unless he be born again. If you are not born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Do not allow yourself to be deceived by the enemy or to deceive yourself. The word of God says no man can see the kingdom of God. Unless he be born again. Jesus answered that. Nicodemus was perturbed. And this is what he said. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, very, very, I say unto you, except a man be born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is fresh. And that which is born of the spirit his spirit and of course he continued to read him and we come to verse 14 he gives him the revelation of what will happen and he said as moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness even so must the son of man be lifted up what happened in numbers chapter 21 the bible says that the children of israel when they came to to the land of edom they they spoke against god because of the weariness of the journey and against moses and the lord sent some people among them and the serpents were biting the people and the people were dying and so they recognized their sin and they came to moses saying please pray for the lord to us that we may not die and god said to moses make a serpent made of brass you know made of brass brass represented judgment the serpent represented the things that was biting them or in this case sin and so it was lifted up so it came to pass that whoever was beaten by a serpent if they looked onto that brass serpent that moses made they lived and so jesus said to nicodemus because it was analogy of what christ was to do jesus was to come be lifted up 
Though he was sinless, he became sin for us. You know, in First Corinthians, maybe I can show you First Cor uh, sorry, Second Cor Second Corinthians chapter five. Second Corinthians chapter five, and the last verse that is verse twenty one. The Bible says, for he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be the righteousness, righteousness of God in him. You see, Jesus was to be lifted up. He was made to be sin for us, that we may become his the righteousness of God in him. So he says to Nicodemus, just as it was the, the son of man must be lifted, for that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So just like the people look unto that brass appeared and they leave, we must also look unto the Son of God for us to live. We must look unto the cross of Jesus Christ. We must, for you not to have condemnation, you must be in Christ. But for you to be in Christ, it means you must look unto the cross. You must look unto Christ Jesus who became sin for us. Because in him, though he was sinless, he was made sin. So sin was condemned in him. Not that there is the, the condemnation happened, not to us now who are in Christ Jesus, but to the person we look onto, that is Jesus Christ. Because he was condemned on our behalf. He was judged on our behalf. He died on our behalf. He carried forth our sins. And so he gave us his righteousness. So there was a great exchange. So whenever we look onto the cross, Whenever we look to the person of Jesus Christ, we look at the work he has done for us. We believe he died for our sins. We believe he died for our sins. We believe he was condemned on our behalf. So there is now no more condemnation. We do not walk after the flesh, but we walk after the spirit of Christ. Hallelujah. So here he says, I'm still in John chapter 6. So that's where the scripture that everyone knows says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. So if you believe in him, you are not condemned. There is no condemnation. But if you believe not, then you are already condemned. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is a condemnation. That light is coming to the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. So for everyone that doeth evil hated the light. Jesus is the light. If you come to him, you will not do evil. I'm back to, I'm back to uh, Romans chapter 8, sorry. So the Bible says here, there is therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Okay, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So we see there is no condemnation. But just because we're not going to finish today this chapter, we're going to go all the way to verse 17, but we'll continue next week. But just to get the thought lined properly about the beauty part of this chapter, maybe we can read also uh, verse 38 up to 39 of it. Romans 8, 38 and 39. The Bible says, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor, nor things present, nor things to come, nor heights, nor depth, or any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So there is no condemnation. And also we see the chapter closing that there is nothing that can be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. So we cannot be able to be separated. And we, there is no condemnation. There is no height. There is no angel. There is no devil. There is no sin. There is nothing present, nothing to come that is able to separate us from the love of God. It, we are inseparable from the love of God. So we, there is no condemnation. Let me go back to verse 1. There is no condemnation to them that which are in Christ. Are you in Christ? Don't allow yourself to be condemned. Don't allow yourself to be condemned. You remember we are facing an enemy. There is the enemy who is outside. And there is an enemy who is inside, which is our flesh. So the devil will, he's a liar. Remember the devil is a liar. He will twist scriptures to condemn you. He will try all means to condemn you. I remember when I was a very new Christian, when I got born again, I, 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 I had listened to the message of, 
of, of, of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, and for about a week every day, I was bombarded by this dream that when Jesus has come and have been left, he wanted to condemn me that I am not good, I am not right, and I'm going to be left behind. You know, so the enemy can easily deceive you where you now walk in condemnation, thinking you are not right. It is not what you have done. It is what Christ has done. It is not what you will do. It is what Christ has done already. We are in Christ. God has made him to be seen for us. Okay? And it is not what we do. It is what God has done. This is the operation of God. Our call now here is to stop walking in the flesh or in the nature of the old nature, but to walk in the newness of life, in the spirit. So verse 2 says, For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus have made me free from the law of sin and death. That's a reality. But instead of using the word law here, the law of the spirit may be the best way because we don't seem to understand here this law is not written things. It, we can easily say it is a power of the spirit of life. You see, just like the law, we can say the law of gravity. You know, it has a power to pull you down. So the law of the spirit of life or the power of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus have made us free. So it is not us. It is by our believing in the person of Christ that now the, 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 the spirit of life of Christ Jesus has come within us that has set us free from the law of sin and death, which is found in the flesh. Remember the law of sin and death is in the flesh. The flesh leadeth to death. There is nothing good in the flesh. When you read how God condemned man, maybe we can read, uh, okay, just, just to see how man became fresh for our understanding. Maybe I can read Genesis chapter 6 and verse 3. When God looks and evaluated man, this is what God said before he condemned the, the world that was. Verse 3 says, And the Lord said, Genesis 6 3, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is fresh, also, also is fresh, yet his day shall be. So the man is fresh. Okay? And because he's fresh, here fresh is represented our foreign nature. So man is foreign. He's no longer subject to God. He's subject to other things. Okay? So the, in the, the, the fresh is what experience sin and death. Because after we see, the Bible says, the day you shall eat of this tree, you shall surely die. The wages of sin is death. So the flesh dies. There is no flesh that will be justified in the sight of God. Okay? So the, the Bible says here, the law of the spirit of life in Christ has made me free. So now, when you are in Christ Jesus, following after the spirit, okay, we are now empowered by the spirit of god and we have been set free from the law of sin and death that's why we can say sin has no power over us death has no power over anyone who believe in christ because now we have received christ and receiving christ we have received eternal life we have received jesus who is life and jesus give us eternal life and that's what he has come to offer jesus came to offer eternal life and what is eternal life? Maybe we can read what Jesus said about it in John chapter 17. John chapter 17, as he is praying to the Father. He says, This word speak Jesus and lifted up his eyes to, he to heaven and said, Father, thy wise come, glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. And, and, and thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is eternal life, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Hallelujah. That is eternal life, to know Jesus and to know God. So we, we have been given that power. So we, 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 now that, that, that we have now eternal life. So the law of sin and death does not have power over us who are in Christ Jesus. 
But if you are in the world, the power of sin and death has power over you. Because you are walking in the kind of flesh. Verse 3 says, For what the law could not do, that now is the law of Moses, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of the sinful nature. And for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. So you see the law of Moses, or the law of God, as it is, as holy as it is, it expounded and it revealed sin as to what sin was. That's what we have been seeing, looking at Romans from chapter 1 all the way to chapter 7. But now here, we see now what God did. This is not the operation of man. This is the doing of God. How did God do it? The law, God realized that the law could not be able to help man. The, the law could say, do not do this, but it never empowered man on how not to do it. And God had seen it, by the way. All the way in the book of Jeremiah, maybe we can read Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31. God had already seen this, and from verse 31, okay? Jeremiah 31, from verse 31. God had seen this even during the day of Israel. This is what they say, behold, the day is coming, says the Lord. That I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. That is the Ten Commandment. Which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, says the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. And they will be their, I will, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach no more every man his neighbor, and his ma, every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sins no more. Remember when he made the covenant, even before Moses came down, as he was coming down with the tablet of stones, you know, those commandments. When he came down, he even, when he came with those laws, as God was giving the law, they were busy sinning. They had already made a God for themselves. And when Moses came to the camp to bring the law, he found a camp that was in riot, that was dancing to other gods and praising other idols. And Moses was so angry that he broke those commandments. So they broke them even before they read them. Because the, the, the flesh cannot be able to obey the law of God. But you see God through Christ Jesus. As he said to Jeremiah, he fulfilled it through Jesus Christ. Now he writes his laws into our heart. So now it is not the law written in the tablet of stones. That is outside, that is cold, that we cannot be able to obey. But now the law of God is written within our heart. Such that our conscience is convicted whenever we sin against God. And because God now is the one also who forgives sins. He has forgiven us of our sins. And whenever we repent, he forgives us. So there is that continuous, by the blood of Christ Jesus, we are cleansed every day. We are washed. We are forgiven. There is no condemnation. You need not to walk into condemnation. You need not to condemn yourself of the things you have not done or the things you have done. If you fall short of any, you can repent to God and he will forgive you. And when God forgives, he forgets. So we walk in the spirit. But remember, we also have, like Paul says, this other second nature. We are also fresh. Because you are in this world, you will find ourselves sometimes overtaken in our carnal nature. And when that kind of nature is overtaken, because we have set our mind on the person of Christ and we serve God, then we will be convicted because the law of God now is not written outside, it's written within us. We will know that we have done wrong. But you see, when one is not in Christ, he does not have the law of God written in their heart or in their mind. So they are not even able to discern that they are doing wrong. Because already the enemy have deceived them and they live in deception. So they will call wrong right. That's why they will easily choose to sin and justify sin. You'll find the world we live in, when you observe the world, they will, they will parade gay, parade and call it right, human right. They will say abortion is your choice. They don't call it murder. They will call fornication enjoyment. 
they will call adulterous kind of life. There is in stress, whatever they call it. But it is important to know that when you come to Christ Jesus, the law of God now is written in our heart. We are now read by the Spirit. We are not under the condemnation. Uh, the, we are not under the, the, the law of sin and death. But we are under the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. We are justified. We are exalted. You know, we are lifted by God, guided by God. We now have power to obey Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Verse 4. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Maybe let me expound verse 3. The Bible says that the law was weak. Yes, we have seen that. The Moses had to break it. But now God sending his own son in the likeness, not sinful. Jesus was not sinful. But he came in the likeness of the sinful man. You know, Adam sinned. And all of us are born of Adam. That is the fresh nature. But now Jesus Christ came like in the likeness. He lived in this world. But he was sinless. So he is the other. The one now we begin from again. Just like we begin from Adam. We also have him now as where we begin. If our genealogy is to be counted, we can be traced all the way back to Adam in our canon, in our fresh nature. But now, in our spiritual nature, we are now not traced to Adam, we are traced to Jesus Christ. Because he came in the likeness, but sinless. And so the Bible says, God condemned sin in the flesh, in that Christ, when he hung on that cross. You know, maybe we can read Colossians. Let's see Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. I'll read from verse 13. And you've been dead in your sins, and as a condition of your flesh, has he quickened together with him, having forgiven all you, you all your all trespasses, bolting out the handwriting of ordinance that was contrary to us, which was contra, which was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it onto the cross. And having spoiled principality and power, he made a show of them open and triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or new moon or Sabbath, which are shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Let no man beguile you of your reward in voluntary humility and worshipping of angels, including in those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fresh mind, not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bones have nourishment and ministered, and knit together increases with the increase of God. Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiment of the world, why are so living in the world? Are you subject to ordinances, touch not, taste not, handle not? which are all to perish with using after the commandment and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom in all worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in honor to the spine of the flesh. You see, Jesus Christ has already taken out of the way. He has nailed everything onto the cross. God has judged and condemned sin in the flesh. We are no more under condemnation. We have been freed as many as in Christ Jesus who do not walk after the flesh, but they walk after the spirit. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So the, the law of righteousness, which God brought by making Christ to be sin and judging sin, on the cross upon the person of Christ when he bolted every written and written ordinances that was contrary to us on that cross when he put all our sin upon him when he judged the principalities and powers on that cross when he defeated the enemy on that cross we are now freed we walk not after the flesh but we walk after the spirit the question is how is your walk because it seems everything here is being decided by how we walk. Verse 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. 
but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, brethren, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if any man has not the spirit of Christ, he's none of his. So you see here, it is about how you walk, how you think. What is it that you think? What, what have you set your mind onto? The enemy makes people to set their mind on the things of men. You know, the devil wants you to set yourself to achievement of this world, the honor of this world the last of this world, you know? But, but God wants you to set your mind on the things that are of Christ. You know, you know, there was a time when Jesus rebuked Peter. Maybe we can read Matthew chapter 16. He rebuked Peter and he called him Satan. Let's read what Jesus said to him. From verse 20, the Bible says, uh, Matthew 16. Remember Jesus had asked them in this chapter, who do men say I am? Peter, by the revelation of God, had said Jesus was a Christ, the son of the living God. But when Jesus now began to unfold the, 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 the gospel that he was to die on the cross from verse 20, you know, this is what, let's read from verse 20. Then charged his disciples, then he charged his disciples that they should not tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. And from that time forth, began Jesus to show his disciples how that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again on the third day. So he began to reveal the whole mission of salvation. Then the Bible says, verse 22, then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him can you imagine Peter rebuking his master? He began to rebuke him saying, Be far from thee, Lord. This shall not be unto thee. You know, and there are many people who don't want God's will to be fulfilled. They want to see, to say as if they can guide the course of how the nature will go or how things will be. There are so many people who are so deceived. You know, they, they, they have believed they can even change the mind of God. Do not be deceived. We must submit ourselves to what God has said. We cannot change what God has said. We cannot change what God has ordained. We can only submit ourselves to what God has ordained. But there are people who will, of course, proclaim a, a, a fake gospel. You know? that you have the power to change things. They will misquote the scriptures. And so Peter here, he's carried away and he says, you know, he wants to be the prime minister in the government of Jesus Christ because they believe that when the Messiah come, he will establish the nation again in, in a way that he will restore the kingdom back to Israel. And of course, there was those selfish aspect that of course was cropping in. And now this is a carnal person of Peter speaking. So he's rebuking Jesus Christ that these things cannot be. But what does Jesus say to him? But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me. For thou sufferest not the things that be of God, but the thing, those things that be of men. So there, there, there is things that are considered things of men. Not that there is anything bad with the things of men, but when they pass the parameter that God has ordained, they become out of the way. And that's why we encourage, if we can read there uh, again, Corinthians, Corinthians chapter, Corinthians chapter, <clears throat> chapter, we, let's read from verse, uh, chapter 3, chapter 3, I'll read from verse 1 and 2, and then read verse 16. If you be then risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ seated 
on the right hand of God. Set your affection on the things above and not on the things on earth. For you are, for you are dead and your life is hid in Christ, in God. When Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth fornication and holiness in, in, do, in donate affection, evil concupiousness, con covetousness, which is adultery. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in which you are also walked sometimes when you lived in them, but now you are you are you also put off those things, anger, wrath, marriage, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man which with his deeds, and put on the new man which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian or sacred, put on therefore, verse 12, as a wreck of God, holy and beloved, the voice of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man has a quarrel against any, even as Christ has forgiven you, or so also you do, and above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfection. Let the peace of God rule in your heart, to which also you are called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of God, or let the word of Christ, dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching, admonishing one another in psalms, in hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Hallelujah. So we see that's how we set our mind on the mind of the spirit. But you see there, you can see how we are told to put, to fortify, uh, mortify our body, you know, our freshly, how to put away those wrath, anger, blah, blah, all those evil things that come in the flesh. We need to put on the new man. We need to crucify that old man that we were and how do we do this by setting our mind on the things above on the person of christ but you see to be spiritually minded that is to be sure minded but to be carnally minded you set your thing your mind on canarity you know and there is there is no help for someone who set himself on the things of the fresh maybe i can read you what the bible says about the fresh Maybe let's read, uh, let's read Galatians. Let's explain in Galatians, Galatians chapter 5. I'll read from verse, let me read from verse 16. This I say, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the last of the flesh. So if you walk in the spirit, you shall not fulfill the last of the flesh. For the flesh lasteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary one unto another so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you are read of the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the work of the flesh are this. <clears throat> Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, ravishousness, idolatry, witchcraft. There are many people who want to magnify witchcraft in the times we live in. It is part of the flesh. It is work of the flesh. The power of it is in the flesh. Don't set your mind on witches and what have you. You know, those things are in the flesh. It's idolatry. Hatred. Variance, immunition, wrath, strife, seditiousness, heresy, envy, murder, drunkenness, reviring, and such alike, of which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no law. And they that are in Christ, have crucified the flesh with the affection and lust. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another and envying one another. What is fresh? So we are called to walk in the spirit. Because when we walk in those freshly things, we are in enmity with God. We need not to be in enmity with God. And how do we prove that we are walking in the spirit? It is given in chapter verse 9 that the Spirit of Christ must indeed be new. 
How do you get the spirit of Christ? It is when you believe in the person of Jesus Christ. It is when we submit ourselves to the person of Christ. Verse 10, but if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. So we must allow the Holy Spirit to come and dwell in us. We must allow the Holy Ghost to be our guide, to be our teacher. Remember that's what Jesus said. Maybe we can read about the Spirit of God, how Jesus said. You can find for John 14, 15, but I want to read chapter 16 of John. I'll read from verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I go away, the Comforter will not come. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin because they believe not in me. Of righteousness because I, because I go to the Father, you shall, and you shall see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. I have many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatever he shall hear, that he shall speak, and he shall show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive our mind and show it unto you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said, he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. So then the work of the Holy Ghost is defined there. The work of the Spirit. So when we receive Christ Jesus, whoever comes into our heart is the Spirit of Christ or is the Spirit of God. And it is the Spirit that guides us in all truth. So we should not walk in the flesh. We should not be minded of the things of the flesh. So all things, things pray in our mind. How do you walk? As a man thinketh in his heart. The Bible says so is he. So how do you walk? You must allow yourself to walk in the spirit. You must be desirous of the things of Christ. You must not be desirous of vain glory. Provoking one another, envying one another, despising one another. Those are not spiritual things. That is not where the glory is. The glory is in the person of Jesus Christ. Be in Christ. Delight yourself to be in Christ. So because there is no condemnation. But when you walk in the flesh, you already condemn. You don't want to walk in condemnation. There is liberty for the children of God. There is beauty in this chapter because it defines. We, are, you know, the two, the contrary, the benefit, the the beauty of walking in the spirit. Verse eleven. I'm back. To Romans eight. Verse eleven. But if the spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he that raised Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal body by his spirit that dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live to other the flesh. For if we live to other the flesh, you shall die. But if you, through the spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of let us allow ourselves to be led by the Spirit. Let us allow ourselves to be guided by the Spirit of God. Let God help us. You know, the Holy Ghost quickens us. Let us allow ourselves to be quickened. Let me read up to verse 17. We'll stop there. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you are not, you have not received the Spirit of of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then we are heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we also may be glorified together. So we must allow ourselves to be led by the spirit because we have received already the spirit if we have received Jesus Christ. We should submit. We should grow. We should not submit to our carnal nature. There is now that liberty for the children of God. There is the adoption. The world can give the charter of being adopted, but God witnesses and he makes you to be his son or his daughter. 
where we have eternal life, where we become heirs of God, joint heirs with our Lord Jesus Christ. What a privilege to walk in the Spirit. What a privilege to know that today there is no condemnation. Don't allow yourself to be condemned because nothing will be able to separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Don't submit to the way of the flesh. Submit yourself to the way of the Spirit. Allow yourself to be quickened by the Holy Spirit. Allow the Holy Ghost to guide you. He's there. He's coming to our heart. Let us allow him to indwell our heart. Let us allow ourselves to be transformed in our thinking, in our way of life. Let us allow, as Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 16 says, For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Allow the mind of Christ to be in you. Allow the mind of Christ to be the one that you submit unto. Don't submit to the carnal mind. Allow yourself to be guided by the Holy Ghost. He lives in us if we are born again. Let us grow and be sensitive to him because they that worship the Father must worship him in truth and in spirit. Let us allow, we'll read next week, that it is the Holy Ghost who help us even in our prayer. But let's stop there by allowing ourselves not to walk in the spirit, uh, in the canal, but walk in the spirit, allowing the, the spirit of life, the power of the spirit to quicken us so that we don't live in condemnation. Let us not allow the devil, man, or whoever, or even ourselves to condemn ourselves because there is now no more condemnation to anyone who is in Christ Jesus. Until next time, may God bless you. May God make his face to shine upon thee. May he give thee peace and cheers. I sign off. Bye-bye.